would like to call Silicon Valley Clean Energy Board of Directors. Study session special meeting to order today is August 14th. And we have a very special presentation today, something we have been waiting for a long time, and it impacts every single city, all the customers we have. And we are going to get started with roll call from Andrea. Thank you, Andre. Thank you. I will start with Director Lee. Present. Director Mohan. Here. Klein. Present. Chair Walia. Here. Vice Chair Tyson. Here. Director Mekacek. Present. Alternate Director Russo. Uh, yes. Skozola. Here. Showalter. And joining us remotely, uh, Director Chua. Here. Thank you. And I will note that we do have a quorum of our board present. Thank you, Andrea. Comment. May I make a comment, please? Please. I just got a text from Director Meadows. She didn't know that there was a Zoom option. Is there, can somebody send her an update or something of that nature? Yes, we can okay. send it. Thanks. Do we have any public comment on non-agendized items? Okay, let's get started with the one item on the agenda, which is a study session exploring impacts of policies on customer affordability. Okay, well, good evening or good late afternoon. I'm Monica Padilla, the uh, Chief Executive Officer for SVCE. So welcome everyone to our study session on affordability. Thank you so much for uh, making the extra time to meet before our board meeting tonight to talk about a very important uh, topic. And thank you to the community who came out. Uh, we were hoping to get a broader kind of uh, participation from the community, but we'll continue to, to figure out how we can get more people engaged in, in attending these meetings, especially when we talk about these really important uh, items. So affordability is a very complex issue and a very important issue. And we know it's one that impacts all of our customers. Some customers it impacts um, more than others. But um, tonight we're really going to talk about some just high level items around affordability, uh, what drives affordability, um, our kind of role in helping with shape advocacy and programs and rates. We're not here tonight to define what affordability is. And so that in itself is a, a whole discussion. And there are agencies and metrics out there about what determines affordability, but we all understand that it's very unique and very individual to the person who is assessing whether something is affordable or not. But nonetheless, we'll try to give some, some guidance on how we might be able to measure this. So, um, <clears throat> oh, we're on the next slide. Okay, just a, we have some uh, speakers here from staff. Uh, these uh, staff members are experts in this area, in the area of, of providing uh, policy advocacy, both on legislative and regulatory, and understanding rates and, and customer programs and services. Uh, again, we're not experts in affordability. This is something that we're learning as we go along. This is kind of a new thing for us because our, really, our focus has been primarily on clean and reliable. So tonight we will have speakers uh, Don, Benna, and Marin present to you. And uh, I'm not gonna go over the agenda, but I will go over some, some ground rules here. Um, we have about 45 minutes of slides. And so we ask that you let us go through all the slides and then we'll open up for Q&A from the board along with the community. Um, we, have provided some post-its for you to jot your questions down as we go along so that you don't lose uh, your train of thoughts. We know that happens. And then I think that's about it. So with that, I'm going to hand it over. Oh, I have one more slide. Sorry. Next slide. Okay, so uh, you've all seen kind of our mission and what we try to balance. I think we pride ourselves in, in our mission and we pride ourselves in providing what we believe to be a very reliable and clean uh, set of power resources. We also are very proud of the programs and services that we offer our customers and that are in development. We believe they are innovative and they can help our customers meet their electrification uh, objectives. This affordability is a challenge for us. And again, it's one that we're trying to grapple with ourselves and understand our role. But if we don't balance the 
every part of our mission, so reliable, clean, and uh, innovative programs with affordability, we run the risk of really not being able to carry through on our mission because we understand that electrification is very, very much dependent on affordability. That is, customers will not electrify if they can't afford to do so. So this is an important con topic, and I think one that we'll continue to have discussions with the board and the community on. So with that, I will hand it over to Don, who's going to talk about rates. All right, thank you, Monica. Uh, good evening, directors. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, we thought a, a good place to start this discussion around affordability would be uh, to, to introduce some context. Um, what are customers paying for electricity nationally in terms of the rate they're paying, in terms of the cost that they're incurring for electricity generally? What are they paying at a state level, and then what are they paying closer to home? Uh, so a little bit of a complicated chart, but uh, if you look at the yellow dots here first, the, the right-hand bar is, is uh, the U.S. information. The average rate across the United States for electricity is about 18 cents. In California, it's about 34 cents, so almost twice that. And then if you look in pg e territory, it's about 42 cents. And with our 4% discount on generation, we're in it at about 41 cents. So again, relative to a national average, we are uh, considerably higher rate-wise. <clears throat> but if we look at cost, average electricity usage around the country is substantially greater than it is in California. And there are a few reasons for that. One is since the 1970s, we've had a strong focus on energy efficiency in California, a lot of the, the um, appliance standards really came out of uh, legislation that originated here and so forth. Um, we also have a very favorable climate. So if you combine those two things, usage generally for electricity in California is about 60% of what it is nationally. So if you do the math and apply usage times the rate, um, it does mitigate the, the high rate somewhat. Uh, in general, in California, customers are paying about 25% or so more for electricity than they are uh, elsewhere uh, in the country. Okay, so what is in the electricity rate here closer to home? Um, this is a, a standard uh, tiered residential electric rate, uh, currently at about 45 cents. About one third of that 45 cents is generation. In other words, SVCE's portion. Uh, the remaining two-thirds is on the, the PG&E side of the bill. Um, that big green part of the, the chart that you see is distribution. It's about 21 cents. Um, other significant portions in the PG&E side of the bill, transmission, that's about a nickel. Uh, public purpose programs are about three cents. And that covers things like energy efficiency programming, um, research programs, uh, and importantly, the, the care FIRA discount, uh, so low income discounts uh, are funded out of uh, that pool of dollars. Uh, PCIA right now is on the order of a penny, so not, not a big number right now, though it's been substantially bigger in the past, and then there are other non-bypassable charges. So that's what builds up that, that full 45 cents, and probably the, the key takeaway is that we really affect about a third of that. Uh, at the, the present time. Okay, so how does uh, PG&E make its money? Um, PG&E is a, uh, by law, a for-profit monopoly, and in exchange for that, that privilege of, of being a monopoly, they are publicly regulated. Um, and the way that, that that financial equation works is each year they they develop uh, what's known as a revenue requirement, and that's a combination of, of their operating expenses, which include things like O&M, tree trimming, uh, procured power costs, and that sort of thing, and then what they spend on steel in the ground. Um, so the, the types of hard assets that you need for uh, distribution of power. Um, and so if you look at costs like uh, hardening of the uh, transmission and distribution system for wildfire, those in many cases are, are capital costs. Um, PG&E is entitled to earn a rate of return uh, on capital investment. 
and that average is right now around seven to seven and a half percent. Um, operating expenses are basically passed through. So there's a, an incentive in the system here for PG&E to expand their asset base because that's where they earn their, their return. Uh, that revenue requirement is, if the lower left-hand box there is basically divided by how much power customers use, and that's that dollars over kilowatt hours is what turns into the rate. And the rates are a little different for uh, residential versus commercial customers, but that, that fundamentally is, is the equation here. Okay, so over the last um, five or six years, since 2019, uh, rates for power have gone up by uh, about 80%. It's a really significant number. And if you look at the, the top bar, it was about 25 cents a kilowatt hour back in 2019, up to about 45 cents now. And in, in round numbers, um, about four cents of that 20 cent increase have been in, in generation, and the remaining 16 cents have been in, in distribution uh, and on the, the, the PG&E side of the bill. So that side of the bill is going up a lot faster than the, than the generation side right now. And we'll hear a lot more about the reasons why as, as we go through uh, our uh, conversation here tonight. In terms of what the, the higher rates are meaning to our customers, uh, since 2020, uh, the number of SVCE customers in arrears has grown by about 50% as has the amount that uh, those customers owe. So um, we had 11 to 12,000 customers in arrears uh, in 2020, owing an average of $200. Now that looks like um, 16,000, uh, a little more than that, with about 320 in uh, an average uh, arrearage amount. So um, the impacts are, uh, are definitely being felt in the numbers that we're seeing. And um, our, our data is actually a lot more favorable than what we're seeing in some of the other big CCAs around the state uh, with more diverse populations than we have here. About 10% of SVC customers are enrolled in, oh, excuse me, are enrolled in CARE FIRA. Um, CARE stands for the California Alternate Rates uh, for Energy. Um, this is a, an income qualified program um, under which you can earn a discount on your electric rate. Um, the FIRA program is a family version, basically a, uh, um, if you have more than three, three or more people in your household, you can qualify for FIRA. It's a very similar program to, to CARE. You actually apply on the same form. Uh, and then are put into the appropriate program. But uh, these, these two programs offer between, say, 18 uh, and 35% discounts on energy. Uh, the CARE program applies to both electricity and gas, the FIRA program just to electricity, and there's some, some differences in, in the, how the discount applies to, to electricity and gas. That's why there's that broad range. But in, in really round numbers, think of about a 20% savings opportunity with, with CARE and FIRA generally. Um, on average, in our service territory, about 77% of eligible customers, customers that would qualify under these income criteria, are actually enrolled in CARE FIRA. So there's an opportunity here to expand enrollment in CARE FIRA and, and help out customers that, that may need financial assistance for, for energy. These are recent PG&E numbers. Um, we do have these uh, by community even, um, and this is something we're gonna be, be working on going forward. Um, one other thing I'd mention here is that it's public purpose funding that supports this CARE FIRA discount. So it's coming out of that, uh, that uh, public purpose program 3% number that we saw earlier. So lower income customers are paying more uh, for energy as a percent of their total income. Um, these are some 
interesting numbers our, our analytics team put together. Thank you, Rebecca and Colleen. Um, but you'll recall that we use this SEVI, SEVI uh, quartile uh, method of looking at our, our population and understanding you know, relative income levels, um, level of need, and so forth. The SEVI 1 quartile are the, basically the, the wealthiest of, of uh, the census tracts, wealthiest 25% of our census tracts, and on down to uh, the least wealthy uh, of, of our census tracts in SEVI quartile number four. Um, in SEVI 1, the average energy bill is $381 a month and the average income is about, uh, let's see, 100 and, can't quite read it, $166,000 a year. Um, and in SEVI 4, the average energy bill, about $253, but the median income there is 79K. So if you do the, the math on this, roughly 2.7, 2.8% of uh, SEVI 1 uh, income goes to energy, and that's both gas and electricity, and it's about 3.8% uh, for SEVI 4. So, you know, perhaps not surprising, but, you know, we definitely see an increased energy burden uh, at the, the lower income levels here. And we'll, we'll talk about the difference that, that Care Fira is making for these customers in a, in a later slide, uh, but this is the raw information in terms of, of how energy costs and uh, income levels are, uh, are matched. And with that, um, I hope you uh, enjoyed a lot of data. We're now going to hear about policy from, uh, from Benna. Actually, Maren's next. Oh, Maren, I'm sorry. OK. All right, so as uh, Don queued up, I'm going to talk a little bit about how policy, both legislative and regulatory, um, can impact our rates. And we're going to look at how it's impacted rates over the last couple of years and also um, what we think it, or how we think it might impact rates going forward. So um, a couple things to take away here, right? Even though there's a lot of different things driving uh, rates in California, there's really policy decisions and policy making behind a lot of, a lot of it. Um, and one of the things that we want to highlight is that even though obviously affordability is very important to uh, both SVC and, and the California electricity system in general, a lot of the policy decisions that are driving rate increases are also backing, you know, concepts that I think SVC fundamentally supports. Um, and so we'll talk about some of that later. But I think the key takeaway here is that we really need to consistently be balancing our clean goals and our desire for more technological innovation with affordability. I think there's a tendency in California to over-focus on either clean or reliable or affordable instead of consistently balancing that um, as we make policy choices. So when I talk about some of the uh, regulatory and legislative decisions that impact rates, I just wanted to give a, a sense of some of the things that we need mean. So there's, of course, quite a few legislative uh, decisions that have, or you know, bills that have been passed that are impacting our rates. And so those are things like SB 100, which is our desire to get to 100% clean retail sales by 2045, AB 32 that established some of the GHG emissions targets in California. So things that, once again, fundamentally SVC was founded to help support. Um, and there's also some sort of one-off uh, type pieces of legislation. So the example here is AB 1373, which will establish or has established a central procurement entity function for the Department of Water Resources. And that's going to, in all likelihood, uh, direct DWR to procure some emerging technologies, which may have value to the system, but are very likely to be quite expensive to rate payers. A lot of policy decisions also come up in the regulatory space. And in general, the, the areas where we see upward pressure on rates is not in the sort of rate setting proceedings that we normally th think about, like the general rate case, or there's even a affordability proceeding, but rather on the power supply side. So we see big changes to our compliance obligations through things like the resource adequacy slice of day proceeding, um, or procurement orders through the integrated resource planning proceeding, which have upward pressure on rates. And there's also quite a bit of public policy that shows up in our electricity bills in other ways. We're going to talk about NEM and wildfire safety in the next couple of slides. But as Don's pointed out, things like energy efficiency and low income programs also show up in that uh, public, 
purchase or sorry the PPP charge on our bill. Um, and then the the last sort of category of things that I want us to keep in mind is that there's also been a tendency in California to put a lot of things on electricity bills that some people have argued are maybe better funded through things like the general fund or alternate uh, sources of uh, funding. And so it's not out of the question that in the future we're going to see new types of public policy show up on our rates. And so that could be things like a gas transition charge, right? So as we try to decarbonize the building sector, there's going to be a lot of stranded assets uh, in the gas fleet, um, you know, all the gas lines that are running into homes. And so how do we recover those costs? And it may be that something like that gets recovered through electricity rates. Um, and there's a number of those types of public policies that could flow onto bills in the future. All right, so we wanted to do a little bit of a deep dive into two of the really big drivers over the last several years. Um, and one of those is, of course, uh, wildfire-related uh, costs. Um, it's, in a way, it's, it's sort of strange to think of this as a public policy decision because, of course, following some of the really bad wildfire seasons that we've had recently, something had to be done to improve safety on the system. Um, but what we ended up seeing was uh, today we have roughly 20% of our electricity bill is related to wildfire costs. And so these are public policy choices. They don't show up in that three cent public policy charge, but instead they've made their way into the transmission and distribution charges. Um, and as Don hinted at, you know, different actors have different incentives for how to uh, deal with public policy, right? So if you're the investor on utility, you might want to address wildfire safety through capital expenditures. Um, there's also questions of if it is a O&M expense, and so it's a pass-through expense, does the utility recover that all in one year, or do you use something like securitization and bond funding to help spread those costs out over a long time horizon? So in any of these public policy choices, there's a lot of different options you can take to fund whatever the end goal is. Um, and so I think that's important to keep in mind as we review policy. One of the other really big drivers of cost increases over the last several years has been the rooftop solar tariff. Um, so if you are a non-NEM customer in PG&E's service territory, roughly 12 to 15 percent of your bill is going to pay NEM customers for their rooftop solar. So there's a multi-billion dollar cost shift from non-NEM customers to NEM customers uh, in California every single year. And a lot of these cost shifts, uh, you know, stick with us for quite a long time. So um, even though there's been improvements, we think, uh, to the NEM policy as we've gone from what we called NEM 2.0 to NEM 3.0 or the net billing tariff, because of grandfathering rules, um, a lot of customers are sort of locked into that NEM 2.0 for many years. Uh, so we'll, we'll live with that tariff for, you know, the next 20 years or so. And in fact, you can see that in 2022, when it became very clear that the NEM tariff was going to change, you saw a, a rush of applications to get in so that they could lock in that rate. Um, going back a little bit to, you know, SVC's direct costs, um, I mentioned uh -huh. in, when I was discussing the, the regulatory work that there's been things changing in the regulatory space which has put up for pressure on our power supply costs. So we've seen compliance obligations changing that have driven up our power supply costs. Um, we're also just at the end of some compliance periods for RPS and things like that, which we are expect, or which we think are driving, helping drive up uh, RPS costs. Um, so this is impacting not just the TND side of the bill, but SBC's energy costs as well. So that's where we've you know, how we got to today. I now want to talk a little bit about what we think is going to happen to the bill over the next couple of decades. Um, so one of the obviously big clean energy targets that we have in the electricity sector is SB 100 or our, um, you know, efforts to get to 100% clean retail sales by 2045. And in order to do that, uh, we're expecting the total uh, generation on the grid to roughly double by 2045 relative to 2020. So this is, of course, a policy that SVC has supported. 
um, but it is going to be uh, quite costly. Um, so we'll get into that a little bit on the next slide. Before I get into any of the actual numbers on this slide, I want to give a few very big caveats to them, right? So what we're showing here is the results of some modeling efforts that have been undertaken by various agencies across uh, the state to understand what it will take to get to SB 100. But these are models that are, you know, uh, trying to get to a least cost best fit build. They have a lot of assumptions in them and they're probably a very, uh, there's probably a lot of oversimplification in the models, right? The grid's very complex. It's hard to model it accurately. So take this all with a huge grain of, of salt, but our best guess today is that on the generation side, as I pointed out on the last slide, we're gonna need about 120 gigawatts of new build. The good news is that between now and 2045, because of all the electrification efforts, we're expecting load growth to, in, or load to increase by roughly 50%. So we are, at least the model results suggest that we can probably, uh, that probably the revenue requirement for that generation is going to track pretty closely with load growth. And so we don't expect a significant increase in generation costs. That story is less true um, on the transmission and distribution side. So the California ISO, the system operator, did a 20-year outlook study um, trying to assess what, it, what they'll need to build in order to keep a reliable system out to 2045. And the price tag that they put on that build was $30.5 billion cumulative by 2045. The thing I want to highlight here is that those are only the capital costs. So the, the O&M, um, all of the, the maintenance that goes into that is not included in that price tag. And we've also seen, seen estimates from other analysts that suggest a much, much higher price tag. Some folks have even suggested that transmission costs might be three to four times what they are today by 2045, so a really huge increase. On the distribution side, there's a huge range of uncertainty, and a lot of what uh, the cost will end up being is going to be dependent on how smart we can be about our electrification. And I think we'll talk more about this later, but you know, how can we help bring down those costs and ensure that we're electrifying in a way that's least cost for us all? So we're, the, the studies I've seen range from anywhere from $8 billion to $51 billion. Um, all of those studies only go out to 2035. So really pretty massive numbers. And then as I stated at the outset, I think the direction that the public policy portion of the bill goes, and I mean this broadly, not just that PPP charge, but also all the other public policy that filters into the T and D portions of the rate and the generation portions, is really gonna depend on what policymakers wanna do. So we can imagine that things like offshore wind or that gas system uh, transition charges that I mentioned earlier could drive rates up very substantially. But as I think Benna and Don will talk about more, you can also imagine a world where public policymakers get very focused on affordability and try to find ways to move costs off the bills, um, either funding it through the general fund or finding other revenue sources uh, in order to ensure that customers are able to maintain affordability. And with that, I'm almost wrapped up. So. Just to um, highlight a few more, uh, a few takeaways from this section. So the major cost drivers today that we've seen recently have been the wildfire mitigation charges and rooftop solar charges for those non-NEM customers. We expect that the major cost drivers tomorrow are going to be related largely to distribution and transmission charges, uh, but fundamentally public policy decisions are really going to determine what our rates look like going forward. And with that, I'll pass it back to Don. All right, thanks, Maren. Um, so what is SVCE doing? A um, couple of important uh, uh, things that we're working on. One is a rate discount for CareFira customers. And then secondly, we have programs going that, uh, that in the near term and longer term will uh, significantly affect affordability. Um, the CareFira discount we're currently offering is in the form of a, a, a monthly credit of $12.50 a month. We pay this to all CareFira customers. Um, on average, that represents about a 20% discount on the generation portion of their bill. 
And that's on top of the, the Care Fira discount that we uh, talked about earlier uh, that was in the 18 to 35% range. So combining those two things, Care Fira customers are, are seeing a discount of about 40% um, as, a, as a result of being on that program. And it is interesting to look at it in the context of the SEVI numbers that we shared earlier. So the, uh, the numbers on the left are what you saw before, as is the, the column in the middle. Um, in SEVI 1, about 6% of customers are on Carefira. In SEVI 4, about 25% of our customers uh, are on Carefira. And you might say, well, why are there why are there care fair customers in SEVI 1? Remember, these are census tracts. It's still, we're talking about ranges of populations. Um, and there are also a lot of people in wealthier areas that uh, have low incomes, um, uh, maybe on fixed incomes and the like. So in terms of affordability, you can see the um, average energy bill there on the, the two columns on the left versus what it is for care fair and that's where you're seeing that 40% that savings or so. Uh, so uh, really an important thing that, that SVC is doing for the, uh, the lower income community. In terms of uh, programs, um, lots of things underway. Um, PG&E offers this electrification rate. We've, we've cloned it, but we've put it on steroids. We've uh, increased the peak energy rate and we've decreased the off-peak energy rate to further uh, that, uh, you know, that incentive for customers to, uh, to use energy when it's the cheapest. Um, our customers that are on our new and improved ELEC rate are saving on the average of $20 a month or what they uh, would have otherwise been spending on the standard ELEC rate. And again, this is really important for like what Maren talked about is if we can direct uh, especially new load that's coming onto the system uh, associated with electrification of vehicles and homes and whatnot into hours um, that are off peak, we don't need to make nearly as uh, substantial uh, an investment in the distribution system. The current distribution system can handle a lot of this, this new load if we're kind of infilling, if you will, uh, into the, the lower uh, usage periods. Uh, that's the spirit behind the dynamic rate pilots uh, that are planned for uh, the end of this year. This is something we're working on right now with, with PG&E, but this will be a day ahead hourly rate um, that will be um, that, that uh, customers and mainly customers' devices will be able to, to read and, and, and operate on to optimize, say, EV charging or um, HVAC. So uh, another important way, it's, it's kind of a, a more granular version of, of the ELEC rate. Uh, as you know, we have uh, been running this program for a while uh, called uh, GridShift, and this is a, an EV charging app that helps customers charge their vehicles uh, when it, uh, it's most opportune from a time of use standpoint. Um, we are uh, about to start on a pilot that will use a day ahead uh, hourly pricing signal to further fine tune uh, the savings a, a customer can earn uh, and, the, and, and help us further direct that energy usage into the most opportune times. Um, we are working on uh, establishing more of a focus on um, what can be done with existing electricity or electric panels when electrifying a home or a building. Uh, a lot of homes in our area have 100 amp electric panels um, and standard uh, or sort of conventional knowledge out there was, hey, you need to upgrade to at least a 200 amp panel to electrify your home. Well, we are no longer convinced that that's true. Um, and we've been working with other CCAs on uh, ways that you can electrify and maintain that 100 amp panel that you have. Um, and we're, we're seeing that this is gonna be possible in 90 or 95% of cases. And, and as we continue to see new technologies come into the space, um, having that panel remain intact as a 100 amp panel is a great way to save money uh, on distribution. That means you know, no new service needs to be provided to that home. Those are PG&E costs that go 
right into O&M, or in many cases, right into the rate base. So really an important dimension there. And then focusing on energy efficiency when doing electrification. Um, we've just started a new uh, in program with commercial and industrial customers where we're really combining this notion of decarb and energy efficiency uh, and doing um, uh, analyses with our, our largest customers of where they have savings opportunities that represent kind of a double win in terms of energy and decarb. So um, these are all important ways we can help customers save money in the near term and uh, help um, help make sure that we don't have to increase capacity on the grid uh, longer term because, as Marin pointed out, that's going to be very expensive. So with that, I will turn it over to Anna. Yes. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Don. So you've just heard from Don about a lot of the things that SVCE is doing, and we wanted to transition to talking a little bit about what you can do as our board members to help with affordability. So the first major action that we wanted to talk about was we know that you are out there in the community a lot and talk with customers, you talk with community stakeholders like nonprofit service organizations, and we would love your help to just bring forward some messages and communicate with customers on our behalf. So we've listed out a couple of ways that would be really helpful for you guys to engage. For example, the first one is for people who are low income or who are under financial hardship, if you could help us direct them to some of the resources that already exist. SVC has a great website, which is listed on the slide, where we talk through different kinds of payment assistance programs. So it could be monthly payment assistance, like the Karen Fair program that we talked about earlier. It could be one-time bill assistance. Um, there's programs for people on certain medical devices, et cetera. So that would be a great thing to do. Uh, the second major action is to just inform customers of SVC's actions. So you heard from Don about a lot of the, the programs that we are undertaking. Uh, one other thing to mention is that we, since our inception, have also saved customers $117 million on their bills directly. And then finally, it'd be really helpful for you to help us educate customers and community stakeholders about some of these challenges that we've talked about today. And that just very challenging balancing act that we're trying to do between clean, reliable, and affordable um, that you know, is, is a struggle at times, but just to help them understand sort of the full picture of the issues. The other major area where you can help us with is really to help us communicate with policymakers. So as we've talked about earlier, this is really not an issue that SVCE can solve on our own. We need this to be a partnership between the investor-owned utilities, the governor, the legislature, and the CPUC. We can't make a change by ourselves, so these partnerships are really crucial. And it will also take a common understanding of what affordability is and what the levers are to make a change. And we think you can help us in very concrete ways. So first, you know, this is a flashback on all the cost drivers that Marin talked about in her section of the presentation that are um, putting upward pressure on bills. And we've listed some of the actions that the legislature or the regulatory bodies have taken. So we know this is a huge focus for the governor, for legislative leadership, and then by extension, the CPUC. And many things are happening in each one of these cost driver categories. I'll just pull out a few quick ones um, to mention here. Marin mentioned that wildfire cost is a big cost driver. Uh, you will talk a little bit more in the main board session, but there is a climate bond on the November ballot this year that includes a significant amount of funding for wildfire mitigation. And it's important to note here that the bill language specifically says that the investor-owned utilities cannot charge ratepayers for any of the projects that are funded by the climate bond. So I think this is an attempt by the legislature to really reduce bill costs by finding an alternate source for funding these projects. Another one to point out is there's been a lot of activity in the legislature this year around transmission build-out, and how do we streamline the permitting process to hopefully make it faster, more effective, and cheaper to build transmission. So these are all interesting things that the legislature and the governor and regulators are trying to do. So we know that you also talk with a lot of state and federal policymakers, and 
it would be really helpful for you guys to reinforce a couple of major points. I think the first one is that affordability is a very important issue for our customers. And it's important that the state and federal government also try to help solve this problem. And we know that ultimately rising electricity bills are bad for customers, but they also really hurt our ability to reach our mission for emissions reduction. The higher electricity becomes, the less uh, viable or attractive that fuel switching is. And there's a couple of key ways that we think federal and state policymakers can really help impact this issue. The first one, as Martin said, it's again, really trying to remove costs that we pay for on the bills today and fund them through other sources. If we all recognize that these are important priorities, are there things like a climate bond, a Federal Inflation Reduction Act money, or the state's general fund that could be used to fund those programs? Secondly, we think it's really important to reduce the total grid build-out costs through shifting load, a lot of the things that Don was talking about, smart technologies, and then that process streamlining on grid infrastructure to kind of move those projects faster and hopefully at a less costly rate. And then finally, how can the federal and state governments really support assistance for customers that are struggling to pay their utility bills? Finally, we wanted to end with a little bit of a look forward of where we're going at SVCE. So affordability is a proposed priority strategic focus area for SVCE. You might remember that Monica's talked about some of those um, potential topics for strategic focus areas in June to the board. I think our goal is really to see how we can support all electric as that most affordable and competitive option for customers. And staff is proposing that we break out their work into three major buckets. One is that education piece that we just talked about. So understanding what the cost drivers are to the bills, what potential solutions there might be. Advocacy, again, since a lot of the challenges are outside of SVC's direct control, how can we work with others that have that power to really make change? And then finally, we're undergoing a process to look at our internal rates and to do some more analysis and strategy about where we wanna go with that. So with that, we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you for very patiently writing them down as we went along. I also mentioned that we have an expert panel here to answer a lot of the questions. Peyton, Justin, I know Chris is on the phone, and then Pam is here as well. Um, so, and Amrit, so happy to answer any questions. I'll turn it back over to chair. Thank you so much, Don, Maron, and Benna. I am at a loss for words because this is such a complex topic and how simple uh, you have made it seem. It's just beautiful you have presented it with such clarity. It's very complex and to bring it down to a level where we know what's happening on the key issues and how to take it forward in terms of what can we do, how to engage with residents, how to serve all customers better and how to think of advocacy with the policymakers at every level. So big thanks to all of you, the whole team, as always, SBC team, great job. Okay, let's start with questions. I want to start in just looking in this order. Pat, go ahead. Thank you. Do expected increases in energy, um, electricity rates, take into account AI energy needs? In other words, in the modeling that you were doing, Marin, um, has AI been incorporated? I've heard it's an incredible energy sink. Yeah, good questions. I think there's a, actually an article in the LA Times about that this morning. Um, I will say that a lot of the, I think all of those uh, models that I was showing the results of are assuming the CEC's IPER forecast, the Integrated Energy Policy Report forecast. Um, that, to the best of my knowledge, they aren't considering um, 
AI to the extent that some people think they ought to. So at a, a, rec a recent workshop, there was actually folks from the tech industry uh, presenting, suggesting that they needed to include more database load in their, their forecast. So um, it's probably not in there to the extent that some people think it, it should be. Um, so it, it might be a, a driver of load that we're not fully accounting for yet. Thank you. OK, another one is um, when we fund wildfire protection activities, who decides what activities are needed and are included in that cost? I mean, who's the deciding agency on this? Or yeah. are there a bunch? That's a great question. Um, I will give it a go. And if anyone else wants to chime in, feel free. Um, so PG&E uh, puts together plans for how they're going to deal with their, their wildfire risk, as do the, the other investor-owned utilities. As Don mentioned at the outset, they're all regulated utilities. So their cost recovery is dependent upon their regulator approving those costs. So the CPUC has to say you know, yes or no to what they do. Um, a lot of it uh, flows through the general rate case. Uh, some costs can pop up in other proceedings as well, but at the end of the day, they're not allowed to recover costs that the CPUC hasn't signed off on. And then, Ben, I don't know if there's anything on the legislative side that feels relevant to that question. Okay. Good. Well, I would wonder whether there was anything related to, for instance, changes in the building code um, uh, that encouraged people to um, use perhaps more expensive but better methods um, or, you know, renovating homes just like we would electrify homes for wildfires. I mean, you know, there's just, <laughs> there's many, many things one could do. Yeah, I know there was a push uh, by PG&E, you know, sort of a PSA is sort of encouraging people to make their, to harden their own homes, yeah. you know, but um, I don't know that any, and I, sh I guess that probably those PSA, PSAs would have been recovered by, uh, you know, rates, but. I, <laughs> I think the insurance industry is really struggling with this too, right? Because we're seeing insurance rates go through the roof and yeah. for people to get insurance now, if they can get it at all, they're often very strict hardening requirements. And just to add a little bit, I, I believe there's a split jurisdiction on the wildfire mitigation plans right now where this new entity, the Office of Energy Infrastructure Safety, I believe has a, authority to approve PG&E's wildfire mitigation plan, whereas separately the CPUC has the authority around cost recovery. So it's it, there's a little bit of a, I feel like a little bit of a game of maybe hot potato also happening between those two agencies, um, with OEIS being a newer agency. Well, anyway, the reason I ask is because if you're going to do advocacy, you always have to know what to advocate for where. And in government, it's never simple. And it sounds like here a lot is glommed on to the CPUC um, who aren't known for being particularly responsive. So if we could. Um, you know, we could advocate at other agencies that might be more successful. Okay, my, my other question, sorry, just wrote three. Um, do you expect it, no, that was the one I already asked. Um, oh, what does a res, how does a resident sign up for care? Um, I, I asked this at the finance committee meeting and um, you went over it a little bit in the presentation, but I think that many of us will, will, uh, will encounter people who you know, they want to know how do they do this. And um, so is there a link you can give us or a phone number that we can hand out to folks? Yes, it's, uh, it's an online form for better or worse, and it's a single form for, for CARE and FERA. It's available through PG&E, um, PAM, other places maybe. Well, to simplify for customers that you're speaking to as a representative of Silicon Valley Clean Energy, you could send them to our payment assistance webpage where we link directly to the CARE FERA applications as well as other payment assistance resources that are available. Also, it's directly available through the PG&E site. So when a customer does log in to view their bill, um, they can look at different ways that they can get assistance to pay their bills. Thanks, Pat. Thank you. Thank you so much. Of course. Elliot. 
All right. Uh, yeah, I also wanted to just a little bit more um, knowledge about the care fear discount and uh, specifically, um, uh, you know, the county obviously has data with people who are low income people who are already on assistance programs. And so my, my curiosity is, is there any mailers that go out or, or maybe informed on the bill or anything like that where it directly like it's known that that household already has assistance in other means and they might not be aware of this type of assistance is there is there anything like that happening right now go ahead all right happy to take this one as well um i think i got most of that question like what ways do we know who might be eligible is is that another way to phrase right your question? and then specifically um because i'm sure there's a lot of people that are eligible and they're just not aware of this program and so how how do we inform them are there better ways like What's the main way that people get this information without just hearing it, you know, from someone like us or, right. you know, from that? Yeah, so right now, one of the ways that we reach customers with these resources is if they are delinquent on their bills. <clears throat> we do send notifications, 30 and 60 day notifications that they're past due. Uh, and in those letters, we link to the resources for them to get onto a discount program or to get payment assistance. Also, a lot of the community services agencies are well aware of these programs and have pamphlets and brochures as people walk in to get support. You know, PG&E used to have a payment assistance centers. There was one here in Cupertino, but they actually closed those down. Um, so that is an opportunity area, I think, for us. And it was listed in our strategic focus area to do some expanded outreach. Um, we do have estimates of where we do see opportunities for areas that might be under enrolled. Like we as an agency don't necessarily, like we don't have you know, income data, right? But looking at ways to partner with, um, in the past we've actually partnered with CBOs and we're looking to bring back those kinds of partnership um, outreach opportunities where we've distributed information at like food distribution sites. Um, so finding other ways to find people who are getting other assistance um, in addition to in, just including the information and in, in other communications that go out to customers. And I guess the very final thing is, is it mandatory in any way to inform people of, of this possibility that they may be able to have assistance? Like, is there any laws maybe, maybe Ben, I might know, I'm not sure. I'm not aware of a mandatory requirement. Okay. So no one's written any legislation where it's like if you're 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 responsible to inform like it because at the moment it's obvious that you kind of have to know about it and there are ways I'm hearing that that they get informed seems like many ways but um, it's not it's just not mandatory and that's my understanding okay thanks I'm going to jump in for a second there are a couple of uh, remarks I was uh, jotting down here to share later since there have been two questions. There is a current legislation that Benna has helped me, not requirement in terms of informing, but uh, is that SB 1130 Bradford bill? So I was writing a position letter earlier this morning, uh, wearing my city's association uh, like committee chair hat. So basically what I was thrilled, and please bear with me jumping in earlier, that PG&E numbers, I think you said 77% here for SPCE territory, that uh, care for our customers who are eligible are getting that. For the state, the number is much, much, much lower. Mm. And so SB 1130 from Bradford is to remove the requirement of three-person family to qualify for FARA. And so if that proceeds and becomes law, Benna, if I'm wrong, please correct me. Uh, then the goal is for CPUC to work with the three IOUs over the next three years starting, uh, I believe, June 2025, that every year they'll be checking and they will, the IOUs would be required to report to CPUC, and they want to really increase the numbers out there because there is a big percentage across the state that is eligible but is not uh, getting access today. The other opportunity part, uh, I will just add there's a lot more opportunity because I had the same question. Saratoga has one third seniors and I happen to know a bunch of them, 85 to uh, almost 98, knock on wood, going strong. I know them personally and some of them don't realize and they will not show up in any county lists of requiring any assistance. 
but at that age, if they are uh, mostly homebound, they will need higher, uh, their bills are higher, both in the summer and in the winter. And I personally know, and I have talked in the last couple of years, maybe I talked to Garish that time, when challenges happen, how do they get access? So I think that's an opportunity area, and I can talk offline. Uh, but it's good to hear that question pop up even in other communities. Uh, good question, because that means there is an opportunity for us to improve. Other questions, Elliot? No, oh, fantastic. Thank you. Sure. Are you? No, I had some questions about um, FARA and CARES, but they've pretty much been answered. So thank you. Great presentation and good right. questions. super complex uh, subject um, and what I've found is as we're moving forward if you're talking about um, moving to to try to shift demand out of that very high cost time connectivity is absolutely key so if we're thinking about helping people reduce their electricity consumption at that time we also have to think about them getting bandwidth and making sure that they've got connectivity. So that's kind of a, a comment slash a question. Are you going to address that? So I think you're referring to energization. So connecting the right. OK, so distribution upgrades. We're actually having a presentation yeah, during the main board session. So we'll dig in more on what's happening there. But yes, absolutely agree that that's really crucial. OK, then another question that I have is that um, in certain parts of the county there's a lot of ADUs that are being constructed and most ADUs that are being put in and maybe it's just the building permits that I see in Monte Sereno they don't have a, a separate electric meter but there's a lot of people that are on fixed incomes and or are below market rate that have to pay, or that, that aren't included, that don't have their own meter. So how are you gonna address that? And it's a rhetorical question, I just am bringing that up. Um, and then on slide nine, uh, you had a graph on, on the arrears that SVCE has, and I'm assuming that if you pay a bill, a PG&E bill that includes your, your SVCE amount due, if you're in arrears on that, it gets split between PG&E and uh, SVCE. Is that correct? Uh, yes, it is. And uh, historically, it wasn't the case. Um, it wasn't really until COVID happened that this old waterfall payment system they had where effectively PG&E got paid first, um, got uh, sorted out, and now it's, it's, it's basically weighted based on what the debt is, PG&E versus CCA. And um, I don't know, Marin or Benna, they're, I think they were looking to make this official for the rest of time, right? Uh, yeah, the CPC issued a proposed decision just earlier this week, making that the case, the, the standard policy indefinitely. So um, not officially voted out yet, but given it's now a PD, it's, it's very likely to go through. Okay, thank you. And then I'll just make one final comment. And that's, uh, I've learned through a recent rate case that I'm still involved with on the water side, um, not all the costs and the revenue changes go through a GRC. It's amazing how many, how, how much of a rate increase goes through advice letters and other things, but that's a whole separate regulatory <laughs> topic. But I, I did want to make that point, you know, it's not just the GRC. George? Appreciate the discussion and uh, and the way you've approached it, including what can we do, you know, so that it's not just an academic exercise. Appreciate that. We've talked a little bit about complexity and and also people's bills. And one of the th I think if you ask ten people if they understand their utility bill, you know what the answer would be. And um, and I'm not saying that we can do something here about that, but I suspect it's very hard to improve what you can't measure. 
And if you can't figure out your bill, I don't know how you as an individual are going to say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to insulate that, I'm going to change the lighting here. And, and so those are useful things. We're, we're an electricity company, and I, and I feel it's appropriate that you focused on that. I will say I, I continue to be interested when we talk about electrification, how it compares to our alternative, which could be natural gas. And so I'd be interested just on an ongoing basis to know what are the things going on with natural gas pricing and supply. Also, I'm really curious about the whole uh, greenhouse gas potential of methane leakage and, and anything that's going on, because I feel like that's kind of a low-hanging fruit worldwide to say, let's reduce our methane leakage, and that's a way we can improve our global uh, climate change potential uh, more immediately. So that's about it for me. It's so, more of a commentary than a question, but if you have it. Yeah, so I'm, interesting question, gas versus electricity, we, I think in an appendix at one time, we did speak to that a little bit. Also, the slide that showed the cost by SEVI, we broke out uh, what Good. customers pay on average for gas versus electricity. They pay about one third of their overall energy bill you know, to the gas company and about two thirds to the electric yeah. company, yeah. super round numbers. And that seemed to apply pretty generally across SEVIs. Um, we've also, again, at super round numbers, if you look at that 80% increase in electric rates since 2019, about a 60% increase in gas rates. So okay. not okay. as high, but still substantial. Yeah. And, and you're right, we do really have to think about the relative cost of, of those two commodities because it's essential to, to what we're trying to do here. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, I'll you. just make a couple comments too. So I was the one who said we need to cut some stuff out of this deck. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the natural gas discussion got was one of the ones that got cut. There was also a suggestion uh, about trying to provide an overview and understanding of your bill, and we just figured that would be take a lot of time. So what we're going to do, however, is as we're putting together and always refining the materials that we use to orient new board members, that'll be one of the components of that, and we'll certainly share it with any existing board member as well. But it is a complicated thing, and it probably would take a net, um, maybe an hour. Peyton is the resident expert, so if you have any questions after the session, you can certainly ask him. And then I also wanted to let you know that uh, in the regular board agenda today, we have a presentation by Jessamine Allen on on-bill uh, financing, and definitely the, that play between natural gas rates and electricity rates is going to be a key determinant on whether or not electrification is cost-effective, and so she'll talk a little bit about that as well. Thanks, George. There. Thank you. I had a lot of the same questions along CARE and Farah. So one of them also goes to gas. So so CARE only goes to electricity? It's the other and, way around. Or uh, Farah. Farah is only for electricity. Okay. And as far from an application process standpoint, can residents be part of both? Is uh, Just trying to get a better idea of that whole... You're, you're in one or the other. Right. And... What I've read is that if you apply for one but don't qualify, they check to see if you if you may qualify for the other. Okay. And the the criteria are fairly close. The income levels are fairly close and so forth. But they do that that check. Right. So, but from a resident standpoint, should they go to one first? Yeah. There, it, it, it's the same application. Okay. So. Okay. Yeah. It's it's the same process, mm -hmm. and they will help slot you into the right mm -hmm. right spot. Okay. I appreciate that. And then as far as arrears, um, is it, what's the breakdown from residential versus business? Is it all residential or, or is there business that's part of that also? It's, it's substantially residential, but I don't, Peyton, do you have any most recent numbers on that? No. In, in, in arrearage, in arrear, commercial in arrears. versus. Um, so, so we saw an, an, an increase in arrear in arrears by 50%, and is it all residential? And then you said by 50%, is it some of them have just not paid for an extended period of time? So, yeah, I know th th yeah. these numbers get complicated fast, right. but um, arrearage is more of an issue for residential than commercial because customers get cut off faster on the, the commercial side. Um, and there's more leniency in terms of you know, when you'll have your power ultimately shut off by, by the utility on the, on the residential side. 
Um, we have customers that are, you know, 30 days past due, 60 days past due, 90 days, but, and then at our, by policy, we, we will send them back to, to PG&E, and I think that's somewhere between 90 and 120 days. The numbers we showed were 60 days, Okay. So these are customers that haven't reached the point at which they'd be sent back yet. Um, but it's an interesting metric, just in absolute terms, to see the number that aren't, haven't paid by 60 days and the amount that they haven't paid by. Okay. And then, and then as far as the breakdown between business and uh, residential, do you have any idea or? Okay. Okay, I just, just wondering from, you know, and kind of what what our focus is, and I understand it's it's mainly looking for from a financial standpoint at our residential customers and what we can do to help them. But there's also the business, you know, the business needs, which I do think is important to look at, you know, from a bigger picture. I've heard from from companies that it's like, well, we don't want to move into Sunnyvale Mountain View. We want to move into Santa Clara, just because of the energy costs. Mm -hmm. So, okay, that's all I have. Thank you. actual write-off for our customers is actually still fairly low. It's very low. Thank you. Sheila? Hi. Thank you, Monica and team. A uh, uh, couple of questions. Uh, when you said that the, uh, the, uh, the customers who are in arrears get pushed to PG&E, what does that mean? Are we just uh, tra transferring our problem from here to there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are they are returned to, to PG&E. And what does um, PG&E do? Uh, PG&E continues to try to collect. Um, they uh, they have a, a lot more uh, enforcement power than we do. They have all the credit information for these customers, which we don't have. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, they're they're much better as a collection agency. They also ultimately have authority over whether that customer is going to have their power turned off or not. Um, so this is this is a standard uh, sort of part of the operating agreement that community choice agencies have with with the IOUs is that they do have this right to to return customers for non-payment, so it's a policy that, that we've had in place since the start. We suspended it for probably three years um, during kind of the COVID period, and we've we've reinstated it, I'd say, over what, the last year and a half. So when you suspended it, you just didn't collect? We didn't, and and those numbers got really big. <laughs> um, they've, they've come down some. It, there was one chart I showed that had uh, you know the overall number uh, in in arrears, and it it definitely peaked probably a year and a half ago before the the sendback started or resumed. Don, just a clarifying question: We have no say in whether they get shut off or not, though. That's entirely on PG&E's decision. That's PG &E. Yeah. Um, another question: uh, You said that one of the ways you could. Uh, make things easier on uh, customers when they see their bills is by uh, removing some charges which show up on the bill now, and that maybe it could be funded in different ways. I, I think you mentioned the general fund. Uh, so I wasn't sure what that was. Is it general fund or whose general fund? Sorry, I should clarify, it's the state's general fund. There, yeah, so there was a bill that didn't make it this year that would have actually established a climate equity trust fund at the state level where a lot of these public purpose programs like the bill assistance through Karen Farah could be funded from another statewide source. And this year, obviously, the state's general fund wasn't in a very good position financially, so there wasn't excess money. But the idea is that maybe you could use other kinds of proceeds, for example, cap and trade funding or you know, this year they did pass a climate bond, but to use other places where you can fund those programs, like Monica said, taxpayer revenue versus ratepayer revenue. Oh yeah. I might add to that really quickly. I think some of this is, you know, just bringing down rates overall, but I think there's also a number of stakeholders who have pointed out that there's a, a sense that it's, it's that there are things that are showing up on electricity bills that really aren't 
necessarily related to electrical charges. So it's trying to sort of correct what is perceived as a, a misallocation of funds. So there's some wildfire mitigation that is not directly tied to safety of the grid. If we have these offshore wind projects built, there's a huge amount of port infrastructure that needs to come along with that. Some of that is going to enable the offshore wind, but there's also other benefits uh, to those port communities. So it's, it's, it's not just how can we get the bill as low as possible, but how can we make sure that the bill is represented, uh, representative of electricity charges and not broader public po policy that's not directly tied to electricity service. Kind of the unpopular thing to say would be the other way to kind of deal with some of this problem is to look at the, the IOU's business structure itself and the way that the IOU's get compensated for their assets. That very, what some believe to be a high rate of return with no real risk associated with it. So there are people out there who are saying, CPC, perhaps you need to look at how the shareholders benefit because there's only so many things that you can do at the end of the day, right? But that certainly is something that is part of the equation and, and what, I guess, appetite does the regulators or the state legislators have to deal with that? So is there something uh, sort of solid or tangible that's in progress to make this happen, or is this just some, something that would be nice to see, but nothing really happening? Yeah. So that bill I mentioned earlier is actually the second year they tried this bill, and it has failed both times. So I think, and this year in particular was a hard environment to talk about tapping the general fund, but I suspect that this idea will continue to come around because there is just a lot of pressure to help solve the affordability issue. So there might be more now, but this current iteration is not moving forward right now. Yeah, thank you. This is a, a wonderful presentation. Again, I echo my colleagues here uh, of uh, a good job for Monica and your staff to uh, meet and putting all this together. Um, regarding the arrears issue here, you mentioned that PG&E used to have these payment assistance center, but they were now closed. So. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be part of the reason why our rear has gone up because these payment assistance centers is not doing their job to help people uh, get these payments? Or oh, is it close because of COVID or how that happened? I know, Peyton, if you have more information or Don about this, but this is a place where people go would go to physically pay their bills. Um, I don't know if there's any relationship in arrearages and them not having a place to go. I think it really was a specific population who would go and pay their bill by check or in cash, right? So you can imagine that there's certain, certain populations that may need some more support Absolutely. in the absence of these. Yes. Um, do you know anything else about how they're being replaced? I know some, for example, uh, Sonoma Clean Power, they are creating their own customer care exactly. center in downtown Santa Rosa, right. where it's also talking about, you know, of course, their programs and stuff. Yeah, another thing to bear in mind, right? Electricity rates up 80% since 2019. Gas rates up 60%. That's the number one cause of, you know, the, the growth in arrearage and difficulty people are having paying because incomes haven't gone up, obviously, at that same rate. Yeah, yeah, plus inflation for everything else, right? So is SVC, are we planning to create some kind of agency like that to help uh, individuals, rate payers potentially to pay in cash or provide these type of care and uh, fair uh, uh, assistance uh, in different languages for it, folks? It's, and, yeah, it's not something that's been a focus of ours, um, quite frankly. I think it is something that we've talked about and we've talked about joining with other CCAs like Peninsula Clean Energy or San Jose uh, Clean Energy because they're our neighbors if we wanted to create a joint type of center like that. Um, as you know, we also have plans to, in the future, buy a building. And I think that one of the things there too would be what, how could we best utilize space? Could we use it to be both a demo center and a community center and a place where customers could come learn more about our services and their bills and get assistance? So it's definitely something that we're, trying to figure out how to do this and how to do it you know, efficiently because it's not, there's not a huge demand for it, but for those who need it, it's really important. 
I mean, it's clearly for the most vulnerable communities. Exactly. And we know where those communities mostly are. And I mean, the county certainly have a lot of those type of uh, work with 51C3s. So I think this might uh, yeah. encourage a potential partnership with the county and some nonprofit and to offer that as a service and, and language to the to the. Yeah. Breakers. And that's definitely in our strategic focus area. This outreach, this education, as Pam mentioned, working with CBOs in the community who we know already have those relationships with the communities that have the biggest need. And so definitely that's part of our work plan as well. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. we can work on that. That would be great. Um, on the screen, if you can go back, there was a chart that talks about the savings of the different SEVI levels. And I saw that the final average um, payment for SEVI, three and four to be exactly the same at 158, which didn't seem to make sense because of the percentages uh, of the discount is higher in the 74 level. I don't know if that's the typo or is there a reason why 73 and 74 has the same average payment amount? Not that one. Uh, keep going. The one looks like that, but the one with the uh, keep going. Slide 22. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I spotted that 158 for 73 and 4. I wasn't sure if the typo was actually the same amount that those two levels would pay. So the average, I'm looking at the average monthly energy bill, and I think that in, so the, if we look over on the left side of the chart, um, yeah, it's $263 is the average energy bill for SEVI 3 and 253 for 4. So it's it's statistically pretty close, right? Um, it's 158 versus 263, 158 versus 253. Um, yeah, it's probably just rounding almost. Did, did, yeah. Peyton, use the microphone. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. For three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there are differences between those two groups in the amount of gas that they use as well. And uh, the CARE discount applies to both electric and gas, whereas FARA applies to only electric. And the category on the far right is CARE and FARA combined. Okay, thank you. Um, and then the... Um one thing I, I thought was, was fascinating is understanding the fact that most of the cost of the bill is not our fees. It's not the generation at all. It's all about T&D, transport, transportation and distribution. And as we've learned, that's not yet either. There's a lot of stuff loaded into T&D called T&D. Um, so that seems to be the real problem in terms of the cost. Now, that's regulated by CPUC, right? So that we really can't change that. So my question is, when we say we, as a policy, we have a 4% discount on PG&E's rate, is our percentage only on the generation part? Because the T&D is a fixed amount that PG&E charge. So that doesn't change. So the total bill that a rate payer will get is not exactly 4% less. It's actually only about maybe at the end of the day, one or one and a half percent less. Than PG and E's rate. It's one. It's one third of four percent. Right. Yeah. On the on the total. Bill. On the total bill because because of that difference. Right. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think it's fascinating to see that um, we here don't even understand the electric bill. <laughs> Who's sitting on this board? And that tells you how many ratepayers truly understand what it is. So, as the uh, the generation. Uh, uh, organization, I wonder if it makes sense for us to come up with a small project to produce some videos in multilingual to explain to people individually, all of our customers, uh, of how to understand the electric bills. I think that could be very popular and useful for people. And frankly, I think I could learn something from even watching that, given how complex this is from today, uh, of how that works, number one. Uh, and. Um, then there's a couple of last minute questions I have is regarding the battery usage potentially as a backup. So having a solar panels, having batteries in my house, uh, I have a system that I got signed up for with uh, the Tesla company uh, that 
during peak hours, it would purchase the batter, the, the power from me at $2 per kilowatt, which is very high, but that's the peak hours when, and it doesn't happen very often, maybe one year, say about 14 days or so, where those uh, weather pattern shows that it's going to be so hot during the day, they'll run out of uh, electricity or they need more, or otherwise causing brownout or blackouts. So what they actually do, it's say around 2 or 3 p.m., I suddenly notice that my batteries, instead of releasing energy right from being charged up, is actually being charged automatically by the grid to make sure it get to 100 percent so that by the peak times happening, it would then draw from my battery. The technology is already there. This is not high tech at all. This is already existing for a couple of years. So I'm wondering if through that type of a, a working relationship, is any way we could potentially make use of that type of a concept to find out what batteries out there, we could do the same thing of of, of yeah, that, uh, that program is, uh, that's a statewide program called ELRP. Right. And, and yeah, it, it pays a really rich $2 a kilowatt hour um, um, incentive. Um, our customers are, are eligible for that. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of the providers like Tesla or Sunrun or what others uh, mm -hmm. are, are taking advantage of that for the for their customer. It's nice that they're passing that through to you. Um, I'm not sure all providers do. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, that is, that's a real opportunity and something that we're looking at in the demand flexibility work we're doing to look for every opportunity to, to have connected devices behave in ways that benefit the customer and the grid. Right. As we know, um, not many households still have batteries because of the cost of installation of batteries very expensive. However, given the number of Teslas and other electric cars we're seeing on the streets now, certainly there are a lot of cars with the batteries. Uh, the question I have is how can we encourage or implement system to allow the battery to go backwards? In other words, using these car batteries, which is high capacity to use as for this type of system, that could maximize the amount of batteries in our community to do the same work as well. So we are, um, we're on record as planning to participate with PG&E and what they're calling their VGI pilots. Mm -hmm. um, and, oh, uh, vehicle to grid integration yes. pilots, sorry, yeah. But the, this, yeah, the main, um, I guess I'd say advancement in this is, yes, that, that power from a car battery could ultimately power the home or, or even come back to the grid. Um, right now, there are a lot of, and this is surprising, but there's still a lot of technical limitations uh, in terms of the device that needs to live between the, the car and the home and the car itself. Mm -hmm. So the, the Ford um, Lightning has truck is, is one of the few vehicles that that's it. currently approved Built to, in, in Kia, to, to op, yeah, yeah. And, and Okay, sounds like you know all about this, the Kia. Um, but, but yeah, it's still a very short list, and PG&E and, and has had the lead on this, and they've been working on recruiting customers mm -hmm. who are interested, in, and the list is still like in the, you could count it on one hand, in terms of customers that are signing up for this. Mm -hmm. So as exciting and as promising as this all is, we just gotta get it going, and it's gonna, yeah. it's gonna take more in the way of so we have a i think we have an update coming to the board in either november december on demand flexibility programs and virtual power plants and all these pilots that we're participating in you'll get a lot more information then i did want to do a time check because we were hoping to end at 6 30 and i know we have some uh, board members that are virtually and then we have some community members who would like to i imagine have questions as well so we're gonna maybe if we could go another 10 minutes that would give us enough time to turn the room around. Thanks, Monica. Uh, I have, I'll go to Evelyn after this. I'm the last one here. Most of my questions have been already asked. My only suggestion is, uh, I jotted this down when you were talking of what can, what role can the board members uh, play in terms of both advocacy as well as education of our customers. And I think having some kind of talking point, some information, not right away, but at some point, and I love the idea of small videos, whatever it is, again, I am just totally floored by how you could simplify this to the extent today, the presentation. It's such a complex subject. 
I was almost tempted to say arming us with, well, giving us information of those talking points would be very helpful. Uh, and I'll say the same thing for care fairer customers. Uh, my city has one third seniors, quite a few of them amazingly who may need the help for these bills, they would be on Nextdoor, which has been a surprise to me. Some of them are watching Nextdoor, they don't participate, but they will inform me before I've had a time to look there of what's happening. So just giving you ideas, look at each community, uh, whatever is the best way, simplest. You can't solve everything overnight, but uh, wherever you have the maximum bang for the buck, uh, that's my suggestion. I can see both Monica and Pam wanting to say something. I, well, I just I really want to make a plug that in progress, coming soon, there is a rate and bill explainer blog post, whole social media kit that goes up on our media page that all community partners, city staff, everyone has access to to help push out information. And love the support and idea for videos, love that. And um, next door in the CEO report, um, we do have a call out that we are increasing use of that with our public agency account for exactly these kinds of resources. So thank you for calling that out. Yeah, thank you. And I am very proud to say in the last two years, you have uh, Team SVC has done a phenomenal job providing more information on the website, connecting with the customers as we are going through that growth, uh, there is more recognition, more awareness, and therefore, in a way, more need to uh, provide information. So we are on track. All the feedback, I look at it as positive, fabulous feedback, uh, how to keep going. So I'll uh, stop my comments there. Uh, we'll go to Evelyn online, and then we'll take public comment. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I, I just want to say, I, I think everybody said the same thing. Because of the presentation and the feedback and the discussion, I felt so energized to do something, you know? And as you know, I had, a, I had an initiative in Milpitas to have a incentive corner. And I think I'm going back and ask the staff to make sure that there's a link to, to your payment assistance uh, website and we will campaign to, to bring it out to the community. Thank you so much. One quick question on um, uh, Chair Walia. You said SB1130 will remove the three person limit on care. So my question is, is there a limitation on care? Bena is in a better position to respond. So yeah, the care program is for a single individual all the way up to a household of indefinite size. But but FIRA specifically starts at a household of three. Perfect. Under, Thank under you. the current rules. Thank you. That's all I needed to know. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Evelyn. We'll open for public comment now. Please. Uh, this is a bit of a regression, and I really appreciate a few more minutes and the well, opportunity. Could you, could you speak in the microphone? I please? really appreciate the few more minutes and the opportunity to address you, and I'm going to bring in a totally different perspective, and I come from a medical community, and the medical community that I worked with was Valley Medical Center and Public Health, and that looks at um, communities and cultures, and the culture that I have been brought up in has, is a distributive culture where my CEO, when I was an intern, distributed care to the local communities. So we're in the Hispanic, we're on the east side, we are in the Vietnamese community, and they come to our clinic, which is user friendly and convenient. And it sounds like it is a golden opportunity for reaching people who will come to us. And after COVID, we have more time to address the social economic issues of our patients. And so we had a small experiment with our water company where we placed our um, agents who ask the same questions every time, uh, can you afford your medicine? 
and that's how I got involved, because people couldn't afford their medicine. But we, we integrated that into the intake of patients in the medical clinic, and they are situated in your po ta target population that you've been addressing tonight. They are low income, they are students, they are fixed income, they are the people who need the care. And when we researched it, care is actually um, being used by the CPUC to distribute electronic lists of everybody who is signed up for care with PG&E, and then that list goes to, in my experience, CAP, which is our water company, and CAP sends it back monthly, I believe, uh, and it's actually hard to get off of uh, that list. You have to apply, but you also have to inform them that you have to get off the list because you don't, you're not low income anymore. Um, but it's a golden opportunity that I presented to our water company, and uh, I think it would be a good opportunity also for marketing uh, of a service that you know is going to have high arrears and high problems uh, with affordability. So I just wanted to introduce that not as a solution, but as a golden opportunity, because I see this whole affordability exploding as we use more and more energy, non-petro energy. Uh, we're going we're gonna to need a lot more money to help people to, uh, to address a public health issue. That's why I think, for me, it just wraps into a very tidy, tidy solution. Thank you so much. That's Thank a great you. suggestion. I have one Thank more you. member of the public. Maybe you can come to the microphone. Yeah, that'll be great. You can use it. Okay. That's on. Hi, James Talea, resident of Sunnyvale. Uh, I've been involved with SVCE since near the beginning, but mostly active in the first four years. The last three years, you haven't seen me so much because I've been busy uh, working on this very problem of making, helping people reduce their bills and making them more affordable. Um, I um, was also former chairperson of Carbon Free Silicon Valley, and three years ago, along with Bruce Carney, um, received a Community Energy Hero Award from this organization. Bruce deserved it more than I did, but um, I was happy to receive it for my, my efforts. Um, so I work and have been working for seven years on a program called Home Intel that's um, part of PG&E's energy efficiency portfolio of programs, along you know, similar to a public purpose program uh, like CARE and FARA, as well as uh, other programs run by other entities like Bayren, same pot of funding and public purpose funding, um, and uh, Golden State Rebates is an electrification one that's funded through the same mechanism overseen by the CPUC. So these are public programs. I work for Home Energy Analytics, otherwise known as HEA. We've been running this program for PG&E. Um, it's an energy for about seven years now, a little over seven years, and we just got an extension earlier this year. Um, we're going to go till 2027, and there's no reason to believe that we can't keep extending because we're already seven years. Uh, so uh, they seem to like us and what we've been doing, and it's addressing this very problem. So what I'm going to get at here is um, something that is um, low-hanging fruit uh, that can move the needle. Um, that uh, you can, similar to what Don was talking about, taking more advantage of care and FARA, it's already existing. Um, and uh, so there's just um, some suggestions I have about that and some information to share with you. Because uh, if you're going to be doing advocacy and asking others for more things for them to do and to change policy, you should at least first make sure you're doing everything you can with existing programs. And, and policies and things that are already in place. And this was also part of the SVCE um, program's strategic plan a few years ago, if I recall correctly. Um, and so Home Intel is a energy analysis program born out of the um, installation of smart meters. Um, and uh, 
so we analyzed energy use and costs. We, two and a half years ago, we added electrification analysis. Um, we also were the engine behind the Energy Upgrade Mountain View program that helped 14% of single family homes in Mountain View about 10, 10 years ago. Um, the bill savings that PG&E calculated um, from our program on average uh, were $350 and it's $2,000 in high, um, uh, bigger home areas uh, like Monte Sereno. Um, and uh, so it's 9% uh, or 10% of overall energy use and 15% of that is now gas and 2.5% electricity. It used to be about even 10%, 10%, but because we've been helping more with electrification, it's actually a bit more on the gas side, which is really important because it actually doesn't hurt your margins anymore. So um, I know I'm out of time, but um, so what I request is you should be sending mass emails uh, to all your customers once a quarter or at least one, twice a year. That's what pg e has done to ramp up our participation um, from uh, to up to 20,000 clients, a, uh, a, a new clients a year. Uh, we're now almost at 60,000 clients that we've helped across PG&E service territory. I want to see more of them here, um, and uh, so, and to include it in uh, the payment um, uh, letter for helping. You know, that's we're a resource. So there's all sorts of things we can do, but it's a really um, helpful program. It's free. We don't sell anything. Um, and uh, it's just along the lines of what you're already trying to take advantage of. Thank you. Thank you so much for all your work with uh, Carbon Free Silicon Valley, and thank you for taking the time to come and make the suggestion. Thank also, thanks to the other gentleman from Las Caras. Great idea. And with that, the meeting is adjourned. We have just about 15 minutes to get ready for the board meeting. Thank you all so much. It's a great turnout. I believe nine, ten here maybe and one online, so that's pretty good. Thanks.